Greetings everybody, I'm Dwayne Laughlin. Welcome to a lecture on the subject of putting music into your show. It's gonna be presented in a very casual manner. I'm here in our Grand Magic Theater. I just went ahead and, and put up the TV screen so I can show you some things on the screen. I put the video camera out in front of me. It's just gonna be static. There's nobody here tonight to help me film this. But even so, I think uh, with what I'll be able to do editing in my computer later on, you'll be able to see everything you need to see and understand what I'm trying to share. And so I'm just sort of putting it together to share it for you or share it with you. And this is something that comes to you by way of request. A bit more than a year ago, I posted a lecture all about how to put music into your show. And we talked about it from the standpoint of understanding the emotion of music, how to, to connect a, a song to a routine, that sort of thing. And the lecture uh, received uh, many very positive comments. Everybody was very kind, very complimentary about it. And along with that, I also found myself being asked, will you do a follow-up to that? And in the follow-up, will you deal with the very practical issues of you know, how do you play your music, how do you find music, how do you edit it, things like that. And uh, I felt like this was a concern expressed by enough people that I should take time to deal with it. And I decided that I'm just going to go ahead uh, this evening and put it together so I can get it up on the site for you all to see. Now, if you missed the previous lecture, uh, you should be able to scroll down the Fellowship of Christian Illusionist uh, group page to find it. I think it's still there somewhere. But also, I plan to get it up on YouTube in the next day or so, and I'll post a link for that. So you, if you've not seen the other lecture, you'll be able to watch that because, uh, really, that's more important than this. So the other one is really about how to put music into your show, where this is answering some very practical questions that I have been asked. Uh, quickly, before I begin to answer these questions or respond to these issues, I want to make it clear that I do not speak on this subject as an expert when it comes to music or technology, but I do speak as somebody who has a lot of practical experience. I'm not a techie. I'm not a digital guy. I know some guys that are pretty much nuts about any new digital toy that comes along. That is not me. Uh, to me, it's an evil necessity. Uh, I have learned how to do what I need to do. And I am not an expert in that if you ask me something about the digital world, unless I've studied it and needed to use it in my show, I don't know about it. Because it's just not really a specific area of interest for me. But over the years, I've had to learn to get the job done when it's come to my shows. And I had to learn how to put music into my show. And I had some problems earlier in my career relying on other people. Uh, I relied on them and then they didn't come through. And I finally faced the fact, I have to figure out how to do this myself, and I have. And everything that I'm going to be sharing with you in this lecture works for me and works wonderfully. <clears throat> now, I don't doubt, but what, when I post this lecture, there will be comments and people will be saying, well, here's how they do it and here's the technology they use and so on. And I, I quickly want to say that my way is not the only way to do it, and my way, I doubt, it's the best way. But if you're new to this and you're trying to find answers, please don't be confused if there's a lot of comments and a lot of other ideas out there. Uh, confused to the point that you forget what I'm telling you right now. So make sure you get this. What I'm teaching you here works for me. It works extremely well and I am confident that it will work for you. So again, it's not the only way, it may not be the best way, but I am a professional entertainer, I have had my own theaters, I currently have my own theater, I have done shows around the world. The way that I'm going to teach you here is the way that I do it. It's a way that works wonderful, wonderfully for me to the point that I'm not interested in, in improvements. If somebody says, well, Duane, you know, there's another way you could do that would be better, I'm not interested. And it's not because I don't think it's better, but it's because what I'm doing works so well that I can't see that it would be worth it to take the time to try to improve it. You've heard the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, this isn't quite that, but basically, I love how I do my sound. I love how it works for my shows. It is in, it's extremely practical for me, and, and it's wonderful for me to work. And so if there is a better way to do it, I can't see how I could improve it enough for me to put the effort in to learn the better way. 
And I'm only saying that to you, not to, again, not to toot my own horn and to say I'm doing it the right way. Now, I'm not trying to say that, but I'm just trying to encourage you if you are someone who feels like you've been confused by all the different voices and all the different ideas out there and all the different tools suggested, if you've been confused by it, well, at least here's my voice, Dwayne. And I'm telling you, this is a way that I know works really, 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 really well. So well that I'm delighted with how it helps me in my shows. And I don't have any interest in learning other ways to do it because this works so well for me. I don't know how, at least for my needs, I could do it any better. So that might encourage you to pay attention to what I have to say. But again... <laughs> Even though I just made a pretty strong pitch for what I'm going to tell you, uh, I know I don't do it the only way, and I know my way isn't necessarily the best way for everyone else, but it is a very good way to get the job done. So, we are going to deal with those three questions. I'll run back to them real quick. The main questions I've been asked and follow up to, to that other lecture are how do you play your music, how do you find it, how do you edit it? So we're going to start with playing music, how I do it. And very simple, and it says right there on the screen, I use a laptop computer, and I use either, a, I use Keynote because I'm a Mac guy. Keynote is the Mac version, but PowerPoint is the PC version. And basically, all you have to do is have a laptop, and then you get PowerPoint or Keynote and it, for, to go with that laptop, and that's how you're going to play your music. Now, um, I do have a very good friend, Eric Raymer, who told me that PowerPoint and Keynote uh, you can get them on your phone. So if you want to put these things on your phone and, and learn how to do this over your phone, that's awesome. But frankly, and again, you take it for what it's worth, it's my opinion, but laptops are not that expensive, at least what you need for this, because all you have to do is have enough uh, juice to your laptop to run PowerPoint or Keynote. If it's a Mac, of course, it's Keynote. And that doesn't take much. It doesn't have to be an expensive laptop. And you get it, and you designate it for your show. And this one is just set. You know what you're going to go for your show. And it runs the music to your show. It's not that big of an investment. And it is such a wonderful way as far as uh, playing your music. Now, I'm going to explain these, these programs. Uh, I'll get to it in a bit. But I think before I get to that, you may have a question about, okay, you got a laptop, but how does that get hooked into a sound system? Let's say you show up in a church or wherever you're going to be, you know, how do you get this thing to connect with the church system? Well, well quickly, <laughs> I got ahead of myself. So you're going to use the slides of PowerPoint and Keynote as a means of playing the music in your show. And basically, once you learn how to do this, all you have to do is hit a space bar and your music plays. And I'll get back to all that, but that's why I so recommend this. It's such a simple way to do it. You can control your own volume. The songs stop when they're supposed to. It's just super easy. But how do you put it into the church sound system? Well, first of all, on every laptop that I know, there is a port or a jack, whatever you want to call it, on the side where you have a, a place for a speaker or headphones. And either one of these work. All you're going to do is jack out of that. So you're going to go out of your headphone place or, or if it's got a, an auxiliary speaker sort of thing. You're going to go out of that with, I call it an eighth inch jack. Um, it looks like this. Get over here and show it to you. Get a little closer to the, to the camera for you. But it's just a, a small little thing. It looks like that. I think the proper term for this is 3.5 millimeters. But I just call it the eighth inch jack. And so you're going to travel with some different chords. You're going to travel with um, one chord, which is eighth inch on one end and quarter on the other. And this is for when you get into situations, whether it's a church or a theater, and they want you to go into a direct box. Well, then this comes out of your laptop. This quarter inch goes into the direct box, and you're ready to go. But you want a second chord, and that second chord is the same thing. It's eighth inch on one end, but on the other is what is known as XLR, and it looks very much like a microphone cable, and this is what you call the male end of the microphone cable. So on one end, you've got the XLR, on the other end, you've got the eighth. And this is for places that don't necessarily want you to use a direct box or maybe don't have one, and you just go straight into a microphone, and this is my preference. I've learned that a lot of church people, sound guys, are, are, for some reason, they're worried about you plugging in and they want you to use a direct box. But if they'll let me, I just pop a microphone off its cord. 
This comes out of my computer. This attaches to the mic cord. They control the mic volume and we're ready to go. It's just that simple. If you have your own system, I didn't bring a speaker in to hook up tonight, but if you have your own, let's say a powered speaker, this comes out of your computer, this goes into the back of the powered speaker and you're ready to go. Just that simple, you're hooked up. Now I'm gonna show you something I discovered. I'll hold it up here too and I, I think I've got a picture to show it to you in just a minute. But I ran into a problem and that is, here let me get back to my slides. Those are the cords you need. Well, the problem I ran into was the uh, phone jack on my computer went bad. Uh, somehow over the years, it got wiggled around too much and it wasn't working anymore. So I went in to see what if I could get it repaired and they told me it was gonna be $400 to get it repaired because it's tied right into the main board of the computer. Well, I didn't wanna pay 400 bucks to get that repaired. I thought I'll buy a new one before I do that. But then the techie, as an aside, he says, but you know, there is this little thing you can buy for under 10 bucks and it might solve the problem. And that's what this is in my hand. So you want to travel two cords, one eighth to one quarter and one eighth to male XLR. And the reason for the two cords is you never know what kind of system that you're going to have to plug into. But with those two cords, you can pretty much plug into anything and everything. Well, this thing that I have in my hand is called a USB external stereo sound adapter for Windows and Mac. And this means if your, if your um, phone jack is bad or your speaker jack is bad or maybe you don't want to use it, just plug this into the USB on your laptop and then you plug your eighth inch jack into this little thingy. And so now your sound comes out of your USB and it goes straight into whatever the sound system is. So now I travel with these thingies so I can come out of the USB if uh, I'm having any kind of trouble with the uh, speaker or phone jack por point port on the laptop. Now I thought of something else I was gonna say there and it just popped out of my head. Maybe it will come back again. So we're talking about how you come out of the computer and how you go in. Well, if the thought comes back to me later, maybe I said it, didn't realize I said, oh, I know. So um, that's, that's it's really that simple. You, you simply jack out of your computer into the sound system. But some of you are gonna wanna use a remote and you're already a little bit maybe concerned because you say, well, I, I, I don't want a laptop like that on my magic stand. Well, that brings us to the next thing here. And I'm gonna put, put it up on the screen for you. You can use a remote control to operate PowerPoint or Keynote on your laptop. And it's super simple. Again, I'm not a techie, but I figured all this stuff out myself. What I use is a Kensington wireless presenter with red laser pointer. I don't need the laser pointer, it just comes with one. And this is the model number, K33272WW. Now this is uh, about $30. When I first wanted to put a remote with my laptop, I went on Amazon and I found them for $8, $10, $12. And so why spend 30 when you can get one for that? I ordered those and I discovered why spend 30. They didn't work very well. I had a lot of troubles. So I went ahead and got this particular model, $29.95 I think is what it is now, and it's awesome. So you get a little thing like this with it and you plug that into your USB and that's it. You've got your this, you've got your clicker, you push the buttons on your clicker and it automatically advances your slides. Now it doesn't control volume, but you don't need to. I'm gonna show you how, to, how you do that earlier or later on here. But you just get this remote and when you want to advance your show to the next thing, you just pick up the remote, hit the button and it advances. Now I always have Mary with me and usually a female assistant or two so they typically run all my sound off stage. The, the laptop is back and ready to go. And uh, later on, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a better look at how this looks for them backstage. And they simply hit the space bar. But on occasions when I'm doing a one man show, and for some reason I don't have somebody nearby to run my sound, I literally just pick this up and hit the button. And I know magicians who take great pride in how no one knows how they're operating their sound system. They're clicking their ankles together or they're reaching back like this around their rear end and hitting a little button and nobody notices and they think that's cool. And I think in some ways it can be magical. It's just like the sound comes on when it's supposed to. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. In other words, I don't think it hurts one big bit if you pick up the remote and hit the button and put it right back down again. 
Just that simple. You have it on your magic table, in your stand, whatever, time for the next song, hit the button, away you go. Uh, it, uh, nobody minds. I mean, in these modern days where phones and everything else are so prevalent, you pick up that clicker, it's fine. So don't worry about the size of it. And don't let somebody tell you that the audience isn't supposed to see you hit the button. Who says that it matters? It doesn't matter. Hit the button, start the music, and do the magic. So, I told you this is kind of informal. This is not as scripted <laughs> as a lot of my stuff, so I hope I'm saying this in a way that you get it. But to back up quickly here, so, so you connect the sound system from your headphone or speaker point. You carry two cords with you. That way you can either go into a direct box, if that's what the church or theater has, or you just go straight into a microphone cord with this 1 8 to male in XLR cord. Just pop off the microphone, pop it on, you're ready to go. And, and if you um, don't have a speaker point, a port on your laptop, this uh, USB external stereo sound adapter will solve that problem. You just plug into that. And then, of course, you can get yourself a nice little remote. I use a Kensington, and that is how I advance my slides. Okay, so that's basically the hookup aspect of this. Now, oops, got ahead of myself. Now I'm going to get out of this particular program. And bear with me while I'm going to actually bring up a show for you and then show you uh, what we do to um, control the sound, how this works in an actual show. And I think I, there we go, we recently did a school show. So I'm going to bring this up for you. And hopefully if, when I go back later on, I'll be able to focus the camera in on this. But this is what the... Um, the program looks like as far as how you're going to prepare your show. So you um, go into PowerPoint or Keynote, in this case for mine is Keynote. And by the way, if you say, well, you don't know how to do PowerPoint and Keynote, it's not difficult. And at this point, if you're serious about performing, if you don't know how to do it, find somebody to show you. I promise you'll get it figured out. Just set it as a goal to learn how to do this because it's so wonderful. So here's what happens. Um, I put the little bag, you see the slides here? So this is the running order of the show, here, down here. And I just put the fancy little background on, so when the girls are backstage, it's a little more pleasant for them to look at. But I uh, put in, okay, I, I happen to label this, this is a school show we did a couple weeks back. And then this is my pre-show music. The next slide, it tells me, is what the music is going to be. But there's this little thing here, it's a little uh, speaker, and that's the, that's the song, that's the sound. So what you do is you take a, see if I can shrink this up a little bit here. You simply find the song that you want and you drag it into your system. Now I don't have this, I, I didn't think ahead on this to... Um, put a particular song on the on the top. So just imagine right there, there's a song. So you, you, you get the song from iTunes or wherever you get your music, and you, um, or maybe you got a song, music from flash drive, you put the flash drive in. So you just go over, we're gonna pretend like this is a song, okay? So you just go over, you grab it, and then you just drag it right over into your, so your slide. Just that simple. Just made a mess there. There we go. So you just drag it into the slide. So now the song is here. Now here is the, the, the biggest reason why I use the PowerPoint program. If you click on that, when you click on that, it changes the sidebar. And now over here is a place where you can set the volume of the song. So what I do, and because I'm showing you this with a video and I didn't hook up my sound system, I can't play it for you right now, but what I do is I go in and each slide, this is what's so cool, every slide has its own volume. So I put the song in, I click here, and I set the volume. This is pre-show music, so I don't want it very loud. The volume is right there. And of course you listen to this when you set it up, I have it in my sound system when I check the volumes. But now I go to the next slide, which is the opening, and that was the ones turned up significantly higher. It's still not super loud because I talk over that opening. So when I walk out, the music's playing, it's stronger than my pre-show music, it's more energy, but I still want to talk over it. But then I do an illusion where I don't talk at all, 
And with this one, now the volume is way over here. But since I'm not talking, the volume's way up. And the point is, I set the volume for each slide. So you don't have to have somebody back there riding the, the lever up and down. Uh, every slide has its own volume preset. And the other thing is, um, the slides, uh, the music stops. You know, in other words, the next song is not going to start till I go to the next slide. I used to you do my music with an iPod, and the problem with the iPod was that I'd had to hit stop really quick, or one song would stop, and the next one would start automatically playing. With this one, I don't have to do that. Um, I know that when I get to, when we get to the end of this song, it's going to stop automatically, and the next music will not start until up comes the next slide. So let me review this. I don't want to you know be too wordy, but I'll make sure you get it. You just drag the music into PowerPoint or Keynote. It's the same for both. You click on the song icon, and then you go over to the sidebar and you set the volume. So the volume for every individual slide is set. Now, when we're going to play this, so let's go back. When we did the school show, Mary and Nikki were there. And uh, Mary basically ran the music backstage because Nikki was out front helping me. But all Mary had to do is hit the volume. You know, I bet I can hang on just a second here. I told you this is casual. I'm going to see if I can go ahead and get this to play through my laptop loud enough for you to hear it. But I've got to reset my preferences because right now this is set to play through the USB. So you go into preferences, you hit USB, and it'll play through USB. Or in this case, it went back to internal speakers. Now, so here is our pre-show music. And I don't... Yeah, it's not loud enough for you to be able to hear it. But if we jump to the... Now I jump here. Now all the girls have to do... I'm going to turn it around so you can kind of imagine. So they're backstage. They just hit the space bar. So when they hit the space bar, the music starts. When the music gets to the end, the slide just stays like that until it's time to go to the next thing. And then all they have to do is advance the slide to the next thing, conundrum cube. They wait for me to give the cue, and once I give the cue, they hit the space bar and got to put this in this mic, and away it goes. And if I happen to have something in the show where I don't use music, for example, I did the Vanishing Coke bottle in the show, there's no music. So it just pops up, it reminds the girls there's no music, they don't really need to worry about the cue. So it just sits there until it's time for me to go into the next trick. When I go into the next trick, they advance the slide, and uh, when I give the cue for the music, they hit it. Don't know if you can hear it in there, but the music starts. And so every individual slide has its own music, and um, every individual slide has its own unique volume. So then when I get to the theater or the church, I take my loudest slide, which for this show is the conundrum cube, and I put that, I play that in their sound system, and we set the level for the loudest slide. We say, okay, we don't want it any louder than that. Once we set the sound level for that loudest slide, every other slide corresponds to that loud slide. In other words, I set all these at home, so we set the volume on the one slide, the loudest slide, and all the others are automatically going to be right because it's all preset in the computer. And this way, the sound guy doesn't have to mess with my volume at all. He doesn't have to do anything, which is sometimes hard to tell sound men in churches. You know, I, I say it kindly, but with some frustration. Sometimes I think to justify their existence, they want to play with buttons. And they have not seen my show, they don't know my cues, and so often they mess up. If I could just convince them, and that's what's so great about this system, I say, all right, we preset the volume, you can relax and watch the show. You don't have to do a thing, Mr. Soundman, because all we have to do is hit the space bar, all the volumes are already built in. And by the way, if for some reason, let's say the, the show starts and there's a ton of kids there and I feel like their bodies are absorbing the sound, then all I have to do is go on my computer and hit the volume on my computer and just bring it up one notch and, or two notches, whatever I want. But I can adjust, and doing that, that adjusts the volume all across the board for every slide. So they're all going to correspond properly to what's going on in the room. So anyway, that's it. And you notice I kept talking, so now the music has ended here. 
and it, you know, my, my routines are timed, so that the trick is done, the music's done, but no more music starts, and the music won't start until I give the next cue, and when I give the next cue, the girls hit the space bar, and of course, away we go on the Lincoln Rings. Okay, I'm going to turn this back around. I sure hope this is helpful, because this was a bit of work for me to try to get this all organized. But I want to show you this again. So you simply, the whole show is on the slides. And all I have to do is jump from one slide to the next. Each slide has its own music. Each slide has its own volume. And there's nothing more to, sh to running the show than we hook the computer into their sound system when we arrive. And then we hit the space bar. And away we go. We're playing our music. Well, I don't know what else to say about it. Uh, you know, it really is that simple. And so you get yourself a laptop, or if you, I'm hoping you already have a laptop, this means you don't have to buy anything. You know, there's all kinds of systems out there that can cost you a lot of money, but you get the laptop. And if you understand with the remote, then the laptop can be back by the sound booth. It can be off to the side anywhere you want. Uh, we like ours backstage, so we can, and I'm going to turn this around again, so we can see the screen. You know, we like the fact that you can look and say, okay, here's where I am now. Next thing is going to come up is that. You know, that's very helpful to us. But basically, all I'm saying is you hook it up to their system, hook it up, set the volume for the loudest slide, and once you've got that set, the volume on everything else, you've already set it when you, when you put the slides together at home. So all you have to do is hit the space bar, and you've got music running for your show. We do this for our big theater show. Um, as well as basically any show I do, any place, any time. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. No need to, to uh, keep repeating myself. I guess the great thing about having this on video is you can go back and check it out. And then I do plan to put this on Facebook. So on Facebook, whoops, that's not the thing. I've got to find the, I think I inadvertently closed the program. But on Facebook, of course, you can go back and, and watch this over. So let me bring this one back up. Here we are. Okay, so, so we've just talked about the idea of playing your music, now finding your music. Um, you know, what, how, do, how do we find music that we can put into our shows? Well, first of all, I use a lot of copyrighted music, and I pay for it. Um, it costs me, uh, I would say, somewhere close to $600 a year, but I pay for the rights and royalties and all this kind of thing through ASCAP. Uh, because we have a theater, and I started doing this years ago with our theaters, and uh, discovered that it was, a, a, for me, a very useful tool. So I just go ahead, and I have an account with ASCAP, and I can pay for the music I want to use, and it's really not that complicated. But I'm assuming most of the people watching this will not want to do that. So um, you're going to be especially interested in royalty-free music. Now, I will say, if you just, the basic issue of the law is the producer of the event is responsible for music licensing fees. So if you're performing at a church, it's the church that's responsible for the, the royalties and the fees, not you. So you're pretty safe there. And if somebody is hiring you for an event, they're responsible for the music, not you. So generally speaking, you're fairly safe anyway to use a variety of songs. But just as a matter of ethics and also for me, because I produce my own shows, uh, I am responsible for the licensing. And, and, and the other thing is just, you know, I, uh, I'm trying to decide the best way to say this, but uh, I think that, you know, as Christians, um, even if we're safe with certain things, there still is kind of this, just this bottom line issue of I really, really, really want to do the right thing. And maybe... It's legally right that the church should pay the licensing for these things, but still, uh, in my own conscience, you know, I would like to be properly compensating the artist if I use their music, or else I'd like to be using something that I know I really have the right to use and that I've paid to use. So with that in mind, I guess all I'm trying to say, I'm kind of off on a tangent, is uh, copy or royalty-free music is a great source for a lot of us. And I started using royalty-free free music many years ago before I was paying for the music, before I had a theater. And Arthur Stead, ArthurStead.com here, he was a tremendous source for the music. Arthur had an accident this past year, and right now he's not able to run his website and he's not selling his music. You might keep him and Leslie in your prayers. But his music is awesome. Uh, I have, a, I think, most of the CDs he's ever produced, and I, I rely on them quite often. 
But uh, since Arthur right now is not a source, the source I use is audiojungle.net. Now, I've heard uh, people recommend a lot of other sources. And recently I heard a fairly well-known magician recommend a particular source, and I got all excited. I went to it, and uh, I quickly got back off of it. It's a lot more expensive than this, and I didn't like it near as well. Now, I want to quickly say that there's probably other options out there, and if you, as you watch this on Facebook, if you want to post a good source, that's fine. We can all check them out. But so far, from my experience, audiojungle.net has been the best source. It's part of what's called the Ivanto Market. So if you click on that and Ivanto Market comes up, don't be intimidated. Just find the, the little box that says music and you click on that, you'll establish an account. Now with this audiojungle.net music, you do pay for it. It's not free. And sometimes Christians have a little problem in that they seem to think everything ought to be free. Everything ought to be given to them. And it goes back to what I was trying to talk about earlier. You know, I, it's, we should compensate people for their work. And if people create music, it shouldn't bother us to pay them as long as we can afford to. And the great thing about the music on this audio jungle is it's not very expensive. I mean, sometimes you can find a song in there for $5.00. And I've spent as much as $50 for a song. But even that, if it's a great song, I don't mind. But you buy the song, and when you buy it off of this particular thing, going back to Audio Jungle, you can use it anywhere all the time. When you buy it, you get the rights to use it. So you can use it if you publish something on YouTube or on Facebook. You don't have to worry about them taking it down because they say you're using copyrighted music. You don't have to worry about that. This music you can post. And I think that's another thing that's on my mind earlier. And that is because a lot of the things I do, I like to put up on YouTube for other people to see. Well, I know that if I use my, the music, even though I pay ASCAP, Facebook's likely to take the music down. Because they, even though I have the right to use it in my theater, they're going to say I don't have the right to broadcast it. But this music, this royalty-free music, I can put on Facebook, I can put anywhere, and it's going to stay up because I have every right to put it up. So you go to a place like audiojungle.net, and that's where you get your royalty-free music. For me, it's been the best source. But you say, okay, so I know how to get to this place, but... But when I start looking for music, I still don't really know what I'm looking for. So basically, you are searching for a sound. And this goes back to the lecture I did previous to this, the lecture that prompted this presentation. And that is in that I talked about the emotions of a show and the different feelings for your music. And so you simply say, okay, I'm looking for something that has an adventurous feel. So, on audiojungle.net, you just type adventure into the search box for music, and music will come up. Or you may say, I want something romantic, dramatic, epical, suspense, whatever it is. You type in that word and see if songs come up that relate to that word, and they will. Or there's another way. Sometimes I'll type in something like that. Other times, I already know the general sound I want. I want the old-time big band sound, or I want... A swing, you know, kind of like the, uh, what would it be, zoot zoot boogie, that sort of thing. Or maybe a 50s rock song, maybe a Broadway song, whatever it is. So I can take a word like that, I type it in, and then all this music comes up, and I just start clicking on it, listening to it, to find the music that fits the sound that I want. And if the price is right, then I'll go ahead and buy it. So you can either look for a, what you'd call a mood uh, that sort of thing, or you could look for call it for a sound. You search that way, but also sometimes you can use very specific things. For example, I wanted something that sounded like the theme to the Rocky movie, so I wrote Rocky into the search on Audio Jungle, and a song came up that was kind of based on that idea, but different enough to be um, something that I I could use. Um, I type in Secret Agent. Out of curiosity, I was looking for a song that would have sort of a loving feel, and I love Dolly Parton's song, I Will Always Love You. But I obviously, if I'm going to put it up on YouTube or whatever, I don't have the right to do that. So I typed that in, searched for it, and a song came up, actually called that, but a different song that's royalty-free, that, that works just fine, or would work fine, if, if that's what I was going to use. So the whole idea is you search for a particular sound. It's not, you don't just sit there and think, uh, you know, I'm searching for a song. Well, 
you don't know what these people call their songs, you, you're not, not going to know how to find anything. So you identify the sounds you want, either by its mood, either by a particular category of music, or maybe you're looking for something that sounds similar to something else you know you like. And if you type that in, you may find something coming up that is similar. And so by this, you start collecting your royalty-free music. And neat thing, a lot of gospel songs, um, especially you know, the old hymns and such, um, are in public domain. And so you can literally type in a song like Amazing Grace, and it will come up with different artists who have done versions of that, and, and they're there for you to purchase and, with, and, and to use any way you want on audiojungle.net. So for gospel songs, you might even be able to type in the title and find the exact song you're looking for. So again, I'm not saying Audio Jungle is the only place where you can do this, and I hope people will post uh, in response to this lecture good sources they found. But I'm telling you that this has worked so well for me that anymore, I just pretty much go straight to Audio Jungle if I'm looking for something, and uh, rarely do I look anywhere else because typically I find there what I'm looking for. Uh, one other little thing, I have several friends that have done this. If you know an artist that composes their own music, you know, they've written their own songs, or, or maybe they play some old public domain songs, there's nothing wrong with just going up and saying, I'd like to use this in a show. I have a friend who went up to a rather famous singer and uh, said, I love your music, I'd like to use it in my magic show, is that okay? And she gave him the rights to do it, uh, even though it was a song, I mean, it was a copyrighted song, a published song, whatever you want to call it, but she was gracious enough to say, sure, go ahead and do it. So if you have the gumption, just go up to somebody and ask, you can, um, but <laughs> they're not always going to say yes, and please don't act put out if they say no. They have every right to say no, but you can ask if you want. Otherwise, um, you just go to a place like audiojungle.net and you find your royalty-free music, and one more thing is you create, I, I recommend creating a playlist, songs or sounds you might want to use someday. Um, often it's hard if you say, oh, I need a song for next Sunday, and you go to work, you search for it. It's hard because you're under time pressure and you don't really have time to search like you need to. So I'm always looking. Sometimes on Audio Jungle, I'll be looking for a sound or a song, and in the process, I'll find something that doesn't work for me for what I need it, but I like it so well, I think I probably could use that someday. So I'll end up purchasing it, and I put it on a playlist on my iPod so that I can go to it uh, in the future. And I simply call it Show Brainstorm. And I have a whole playlist of Show Brainstorm music. So when I'm working on a new show, looking for a new idea, I'll go to that and click through it and say, is there something I've saved that I thought I would use someday, and maybe this is going to be the time to use it. Okay, I didn't want this to be too long, so I'm going to go ahead and jump to editing your music. And on this, I simply have to tell you, I can't do it for you. You have to learn how to do it. Uh, some years ago, I found myself saying, um, you know, I'll find a teenager to do it. I'm too old to learn that. And I suddenly realized, I don't want to be a self-appointed dinosaur. I don't want to put myself on the shelf and t say I'm too old or too dumb to learn. So I switched gears and then started, and this was now probably 10, 15 years ago, every year I would give myself a new thing to learn. One year I was going to learn music editing. I did. Another year I'm going to learn video editing. Another year I'm going to learn computer lighting. Every year I give myself one thing so it's not too much to work on, and I learn how to do it. Music editing is very easy to do. If you have a Mac, then GarageBand is already available to you. I do all of my music editing in GarageBand. But there's also a free program called Audacity, A-U-D-A-C-I-T-Y, and uh, it works for PC or Mac, and there are those who say it's better than GarageBand, but it's absolutely free, so you download this thing, and then you just have to learn how to use it. And it's not that difficult. Um, what these programs do is they put, show you the song in, in form of wave. Like here's, here's the, how the song goes if it's on what they call the wave of the chart. And then you just take and you, uh, with your clicker, your cursor, you put a line where you want to cut the song. So like if, so I, I look for, you can see how these things go up and down? Well, I just find for a place where they're down low and I'll put the line there and I'll cut the song right there. So that cuts the song in half. 
and then you can move the parts and pieces around and mess with it, and you'll figure that out. Again, I cannot explain that to you here. If you, I mean, if you need to learn music editing, you're going to have to get a program, maybe watch on YouTube or something and learn how to do it, but it's not difficult at all. It really isn't. So I'm just going to give you some editing tips, some things to do when you start trying to. So now it's not just a matter of you find a song to use, but you want to tailor that song for your show. Well, first of all, sometimes the edits are a little bit rough. You can't find a real good place to cut the song or you want to add, like, uh, add some length to the song. And uh, no matter where you do it, it, it's just a little bit less than perfect as far as that connection. So what I do is I'll add a sound effect, such as thunderclap, a laser, a cymbal, a drum hit, just some little thing, and I put it at the same place where that edit is, and so it tends to cover up the edit. And what's amazing is most of the music in our show has been edited, and I have used it so much I've totally forgot what the original sounded like, and I don't even notice where the edits occur, because that drum hit or that laser shot or whatever it is just seems like it's supposed to be there. So I use little sound effects sometimes to cover an edit that I couldn't quite do perfectly. Secondly, I put sound effects in my music very often to clue me in as to time left in a song. Let's say I'm working on a new routine and I don't want to finish, you know, the song to finish and yet I'm still doing the trick. And so I might put a little drum hit like that or, a, or some other fun little sound, maybe a chimes or something. And it blends into the music, it works fine, but I hear those chimes and I go, uh oh, 30 seconds left in the song. And I might put the chimes in one more time, uh oh, 15 seconds left. So it kind of helps me pace myself. Once I learn the, the, the routines, I rarely need those helps. But when I am learning, putting those little things in the sound song are very helpful. And actually, sometimes they sound really cool. It's a nice embellishment in terms of the show. Um, use bump music or a reprise. And what that means is, okay, so your song is done. Do, 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 okay? Well, then the song is done, but the curtain's going to close, or you have to walk and get another prop, and all of a sudden you have this dead time. So what you do is you add about another 15 seconds to the end of the song, and it's called, you can call it a bump or a reprise, but it's, it's, it's placed so it says, so it's uh, do, 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 and then there's applause, and then it goes do 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 do, and so it's that softer music that repeats itself, and you start talking over it, and it makes for it just makes things feel better. It's like you know, the music ended not quite so abruptly. So um, on the opening to our show, and again, I, I probably it would have been neat uh, if people could have been here, and I could just play the music for you. But we have our big opener, and Nikki comes out of the blammo. We do our big pose. And it's, it's uh, ta-da, that kind of thing. Um, in fact, if I can do the music, it's do-do-do-do-do-do-do, kind of a big ending like that. But then as we walk forward, I actually took a different sound, just kind of a pleasant da 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 that kind of thing. And that just plays softly as the curtain closes, as I grab the microphone and I start talking. So I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but I explained it any the best I could. Well, and I guess that's basically all I was going to say in the editing tips. And, and really, I think this is as far as I want to go on this particular uh, teaching session uh, because it's not scripted, and I've said a lot, and I don't want to say so much that it's, it's longer for you to sit and listen to than you want to. But hopefully this is helpful. If I get a lot of questions, I'll try to answer the questions. I can follow up this more. But I wanted to mention that in this book, 20th century, 21st Century Christian Illusionist, I wrote this book before the pandemic. And I think partially because of the pandemic, uh, all of a sudden I couldn't be seen in person. We weren't doing conferences, weren't doing conventions. The book really didn't get the attention that I would like to have had it received. Um, it's It's my most current thing on how I think uh, magic and ministry uh, are being done in our, in our time. Uh, it's basically the difference between gospel magic 50 years ago and magic and ministry today. So anyway, the book came out in a hardback. It was like $85, and I think it was a great price for what it was. Compared to other things in the magic world, that's a very fair price, really a quality product. But I was concerned that maybe the price was getting some people from purchasing it too. So now this is available in paperback. 
also, and I think it's like $35. But the reason I mention it is the, all the stuff I've shown you here, especially going back earlier to the um, uh, how to play your music, this, the, you know, the uh, connecting the sound system to your head, headphone, PowerPoint slides, that sort of thing. I cover that on a chapter in this book. And I actually have pictures of what our little mixer and our little soundboard looks like and that sort of thing. And there's a whole lot of other very practical things in this book that relate to doing magic in churches in our current time, in our current culture. So that's something available from, oh, I'm jumping all over the place with my slides. It's available from my son who runs our mail order business at, let me get there. Oh, great, went too far. <laughs> Hang on. Okay, so anyway, it's available at LafflinMagicStore.com, L-A-F-L-I-N, MagicStore.com. And also, you can call us directly. You can call Mary at 406-291-2004 if you want to order the book, and that'll be there too. But hopefully, this has been helpful. This is as far as I'm going to go tonight. I just had it in, on my mind, on my heart, to try to answer the questions I've been asked. Uh, I really want to be helpful. And with our Fellowship of Christian Illusionist um, Facebook page, you know, I really want it to be a place where you can find helpful, practical content. So this was not a lecture about how to put a message to a trick. I mean, that's not the issue with this. Rather, this is the issue of what we need to do to be heard and a tool that can help us in making our presentations. As always, to God be the glory. Thanks for tuning in. That's as far as I'm going to go with this for now. Bye-bye.